I don't know if this is the best video for me to be reacting to right now. Apologies for those of you who have been wondering where I've been at the last few days. Uh, I have COVID. Uh, so I mentioned in my last video I did four days ago that I was sick. Turned out it was COVID, and now my kids all have it as well. Well, my boys have it. My daughter's been immune so far. Um, so I've been pretty much laying in bed. Uh, so I might still look a little disheveled. And maybe now's not the time to be doing a video on banned and controversial foods. But here we are. Uh, there are really probably two channels that I instantly get hundreds of people requesting the second they uh, have a new video that comes out, and Salmonella Academy is one of those. So uh, this is one of those rare occasions where I will not wait a week uh, for the video to be out before I'll do a reaction. Uh, a lot of other people have already done their reactions to it, so I'm going to do my breakdown, my commentary on it as well. Hopefully you have already seen the original. If you haven't, please make sure that you go over and support the original content creator. We want him to keep making videos and do it more often. So the link's in the description if you haven't seen it. Definitely check it out. Uh, just as always, a warning, Salmonella Academy is not typically a family-friendly channel, so if that's important to you, be warned. With that in mind, let's go ahead and dive into this one. I'm a little nervous. Hey Majors, so I'd like to start off with a little biology lesson. When a species finds itself living on an island, it can start to evolve in strange ways based on the different pressures applied by the new environment. This is called island syndrome, and while it can manifest in a lot of ways, the biggest driving force is often a lack of predators. For example, the dodo lost its ability to fly since there was nothing to flee from, the saint killed a field mouse got twice as big since it no longer had to hide, and with no one around to bully them, the Sardinians started putting maggots in their cheese. Meet Kazumartsu, literal translation, Rotten cheese. I, I said this a while back when we were doing another video that involved talking about food and things like that. That think about some of the things that we eat that are really commonplace parts of our diet. At some point, somebody had to figure out that you could make that. I use the example of my family's uh, fudge recipe that has been passed down, at least going back to my great-great-grandmother in Kentucky. And I thought to myself, who figured out that you could add so much sugar and so much milk and boil it for a certain amount of time and then add some peanut butter to it and a little bit of vanilla and poof, you have this really amazing tasting what is basically a candy. Uh, who figured that out? Who figured out that you could make popcorn? Who figured out that putting a paste of tomato and sugar and vinegar onto ground up cow that's been cooked would taste really good? Oh, and you could throw on some pickled uh, cucumbers on there as well. So while some of this stuff sounds gross, I get it. I, I get it that somebody figured out, ooh, this isn't bad. It's made by taking a perfectly good wheel of pecorino and letting a special type of fly lay eggs in it. The fly babies then work to partially digest the cheese, rendering it goopy and wet and maybe quite tasty and- I'm guessing what happened was somebody left this out. That happened by accident and somebody didn't realize that it happened. They tasted it. It was really good. So then they figured out how they could recreate the experience. And worm filled. Now, cheese as a concept is already quite suspect. That's it's true. It's milk that you fill with bacteria and mold and let's sit for a while. But cheese is safe and delicious. Cheese is my friend. I trust cheese. So my guard would be down around Kazumartsu. I've learned to look past a cheese's childhood. Strange upbringings are what give them their character. But it turns out, those maggots are still alive. And if you don't chew well enough, they can cause enteric myiasis, which is a fancy term for fly larvae living in your intestines. So I like the fancy word better than the actual definition. Symptoms are similar to food poisoning, except with the added psychic pain of knowing that, again, your bowels are full of squiggly new friends. It's for this reason that Kazumartsu is banned in the EU and elsewhere. A black market still exists, which is wild, and it's not a small one. In 2019, the illicit Kazumartsu trade was estimated to be worth 2 to 3 million euros annually. Personally, I would just do it prohibition style, like definitely don't put these fly eggs on this sumptuous wheel of peccary. Prohibition style. If there's one thing we've learned from history, it's that banning something is a great way to make it lucrative. Look at drugs, look at prohibition with alcohol. When something becomes illegal, 
and there's an inherent risk involved in creating it and selling it and distributing it, it becomes much more valuable. You want to reduce the value of it, make it legal, regulate it, tax it. You know, but if you do, you absolutely shouldn't keep it warm and damp for a week. But although it's traditional to leave the larvae alive when you eat your mag and cheese, some mag and cheese. <laughs> I love his sense of humor. It's disturbing at just the right level prefer them dead, shockingly. In that case, one puts the cheese in a sealed bag, and when the maggots run out of oxygen, they writhe around and fling themselves all over the place. This is heard as a distinct pitter-patter against the walls of the bag, and when the sound stops, the contents are ready to eat, like popcorn. Shark fin soup is one most of us have heard about already, mostly in reference to its effect on shark it. populations and the wastefulness that goes into making it. Until recently. Now, here's the thing. I don't like seafood in general, and I have a general rule when it comes to my food that if it looks like it did when it was alive, I won't eat it. So that covers a lot of seafood. Though I never looked into the nature of the dish itself. I figured, right, the fins are just the only part of the shark worth eating. Big whoop. It's probably not much different from, like, swordfish. Apparently, though, I had it backwards. Shark fins aren't even meat. They're made almost entirely of cartilage and collagen. They are the last part we should be eating. That's why it's only made into soup, because without being soaked in broth, it has zero flavor or nutritional value on its own. They're now, this actually makes a lot of sense, because there are stories throughout history of people making things like bone broth, right? Where you're in situations where there's a desperate lack of food, a lot of times when there's a siege going on and there's nothing else to eat, they'll start eating like the leather from shoes uh, or they'll boil things like bones and eat, and eat the broth because it's better than just straight water. At least it's pulling a little bit of nutrients out of the bone. Their only redeeming quality is their unique mouthfeel due to how stringily the collagen grows in structures called ceratotrichia. The texture has been described as somewhere between chewy and crunchy, which I find describes most things, actually. Other adjectives yeah. present on Wikipedia include snappy, gelatinous, and sinewy. The exact sensation of eating this substance remains a mystery to me, and the unintended side effect of all this research is that I now really want to try it. Like, it's a big trade. I've got to be the one like, that's Like, no, wrong. I there don't is have any desire whatsoever to ever put that in my mouth. Ever. There is imitation shark fin soup available, but I've already decided that it's not nearly as good. So I've come up with a compromise to this controversy. Everyone on Earth gets just one bite. Say there's 10 bites to a fin, 4 fins to a shark, 200 million sharks die, sure, a necessary casualty, but then we can end the practice forever. All done. I, I, I he has thought this through way too much. <laughs> way too much. You can finally rest, Mr. Ming. Come here, baby. Yao oh, Ming. Oh. Aki. What? That Aki. was random. Where? Aki. The Aki is a fruit originally from West Africa, which is most commonly associated with Jamaican cuisine, where it appears in such dishes as Aki and saltfish. It's interesting to see, and I paused this on a really disturbing image, um, how because of connections from history, Jamaica obviously having connections to West Africa, in part because of the slave trade that's happening, how there are connections with culture. Same thing is true with some strange places like Scotland and Austria, because they both have some Celtic roots there. And so there are similarities in Highland culture in Scotland and in the Bavarian Alps uh, in places like Southern Germany, and then of course, uh, Austria. Uh, so this doesn't completely surprise me, but all right, let's hear more. These alien kidneys here are called the arils, and they're the only part of the fruit that's actually eaten. Their flavor is on the savory side, being described as kind of nutty or bean-like. What makes the ackee controversial, though, is the effects it can cause when prepared improperly. If the arils are allowed to completely ripen, they're harmless. But if you eat them too early, or don't thoroughly clean off all the non arils stuff, they can cause Jamaican vomiting sickness. This disease doesn't sound real. It sounds like it belongs next to eastern sweats and Tangerian bone grindings. But that's actually an official term, and as for symptoms, it does what it says on toxic hypoglycemic syndrome so it sounds like a situation where your body doesn't have enough sugar wow can cause vomiting and even death sudden onset vomiting so there are a lot of foods right that uh if you don't prepare them properly can cause can be very harmful or even fatal uh but prepared properly, they're perfectly acceptable foods. On the tin. 
plus maybe death. While Aki-based products aren't outright illegal in the United States, they are very tightly regulated, and the raw fruit itself cannot be imported. So if you're American and want to try it, your options are fully cooked canned Aki or going to Florida where a few people grow it domestically. Next we have Bird's Nest Soup. This is another one that I've vaguely heard of, and for years I just I mean, assumed the I name was a playful metaphor, like ants on a log or shit on a shingle. Turns out, nope, this dish contains an actual bird nest, not like a pile of twigs like I was picturing, but rather a specific type of nest only made by certain species of swiftlets. These nests are mostly made out of mucins, which are- So again, the, the, this begs the question, going back to what I said at the beginning, who first tried this? Who said, ooh, bird's nest, wonder how this tastes? Everything in history that we consume had to have been eaten by someone for the first time. You know, when I watch Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and they pull out the chilled monkey brains or the snake that they eat, who first thought, great idea? A set of proteins that, among other things, serve to thicken all those wonderful secretions our bodies make. There's a little bit in human saliva, a little bit more in mucus, and in swiftlet saliva, look out, pal. So all the swiftlet does is it finds a nice wall, starts <laughs> laying out fat strings of slobber, which dry, and eventually she's got a nice place to roost. That is, right up until some gourmand says, Ugh, today I crave bird spit. Uh, you can keep the eggs, though. And they then reconstitute it back into its original gelatinous texture. Unfortunately, these nests can't enter the U.S. since, believe it or not, eating bird saliva is a great way to catch bird flu. And now the time has come to speak of the Ortolan. <laughs> I, I love, I love how he's presenting all of this, and I'm really, really scared of how he's built up to this one. The Ortolan is a kind of bunting, which is a sort of passerine, which is a type of bird. They're birds. Like many animals, they have a long history of being eaten by- Oh, please don't tell me these are the birds that, like, wasn't there a movie where they, like, go under a, a thing and they eat birds? Was that in Billions that they did that? The TV show was just fantastic, by the way the French. But what separates the ortolan from your average squab or pheasant is the unique way in which it is prepared and eaten. They're typically caught with nets and kept in the dark, which causes them to overeat for some reason. Once it's about twice as fat, the entire bird is then thrown into a container of brandy, alive, and sealed in. While this serves to marinate the creature, it also drowns in the process, thereby killing one bird with no stones. The ortolan is then roasted, plucked, and presented whole to the consumer, who inserts the carcass into their mouth, feet first. As they chew, one hand continues holding the bird's head, while the other picks out the larger bones. This whole ritual is usually performed with a towel yep, or- Yep, this is- I- I'm- I gotta check, I think that was in Billions. Yep, that's exactly what they did in Billions. That's insane large napkin over one's head. There's a few explanations for the purpose of the towel. Some say it's just there to keep the aromas in, while others say it's there to, quote, shield from God's eyes the shame of such a decadent and disgraceful I'll go act. with that one. Yeah, this one I'm okay with not trying, actually. Notable fans of this dish include, not joking, Bill Cosby and the guy who invented the lobotomy. Ah, to be part of that so... Alright, the guy who invented lobotomies, I honestly just wouldn't put anything past him. Club. Our mission is to eat birds whole and then make people not remember things. Killing ortolans was banned across the EU in 2007. Not for any ethical reason, but because French people did this so much that the- Hey, to be fair, in 2007 the EU included Great Britain, did it not? I see the Republic of Ireland is still showing there. You in 2007, not for any ethical reason, but because French people did this so much that the entire Ortolan population was threatened. Thankfully, as of 2018, their conservation status is under least concern, so hopefully the French can get back to it soon. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Till next time, I'm Sam Anella, and thank you for watching. I have questions, so many questions that I don't think will ever be answered, but fantastic job as always from Salmonella. Some interesting stuff. Uh, if you want to see some of the other videos that I've done reactions to from him, I'm going to throw up some links here in just a second at the end. And as I said, please go and check out his channel. Let's support our original content creators so they keep making great content. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.